Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at Cato and the Center for Constitutional Studies. We're joined today by our colleague Julian Sanchez, a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Our topic for today is the political philosophy of Robert Nozick. His 1974 book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, is a classic of modern philosophy. In it, Nozick argues that the rights we all have as human beings dramatically limit what the state's allowed to do. So Julian, Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia is enormously influ- was enormously influential at the time it was published. It won the National Book Award. It's considered by many – the work of libertarian political philosophy. Can you tell us a bit about why it had the impact it did and also maybe is it is it still relevant today? Uh, I, I think it is uh, although let's bracket that. I think in part the influence of that book is in substantial part a kind of historical uh, I would say accident but, but a, a product of happenstance in that it came right on the heels of another uh, tremendously influential book. Uh, John Rawls' theory of justice, and so, I mean, just as a kind of a, a practical matter, this was one of the first strong responses to that book, and so, as a matter of academic practice, it made a lot of sense in sort of intro political philosophy classes to pair them together. Uh, but it's not just that, of course. Uh, I think it's also an incredibly inventive book and one that is uh, resilient, I think, and relevant today in a way because of. Nozick's sort of broader approach to philosophy. He was uh, notoriously uh, an intellectual explorer. Uh, you could, if you wanted to be pejorative, you could say dilettante. But he he didn't, as many philosophers do, pick a tiny corner of the universe of philosophy and sort of churn away on it um, for an entire career. Uh, he moved from Anarchy, State, and Utopia to a book that ranged over metaphysics and epistemology and questions about personal identity and truth to the theory of rationality to questions about scientific objectivity and the origins of universes. Um, so this is someone who ranged over an enormous domain philosophically. Uh, and this wasn't just, I think, a matter of personal disposition but of a philosophy that he a kind of philosophy about how to do philosophy uh, that he first sort of sketches in the introduction to Anarchy, State, and Utopia, and then perhaps more elaborately in the introduction to his next book, Philosophical Explanations, which deals with what he calls non-coercive philosophy. Uh, And his idea there is that instead of um, trying to construct these very imposing uh, systemic architectures or skyscrapers built on solid foundations and then building a kind of soup to nuts picture of the world from the ground up. Uh, philosophers should sort of range and explore different areas and different ideas and not necessarily be too concerned on sort of forcing you to accept the conclusion. He was interested in seeing what the possibilities were. What would it take for a certain proposition to be true? What would follow if it were true? And you know, if you didn't agree that it was true, that wasn't necessarily the most interesting thing to Nozick. And one way I think it has allowed uh, his work, and in particular Anarchy, State, and Utopia, to age well is that it is not a super systemic book in one sense. I mean, there are, there are parts that are certainly ex- extended and very elaborate arguments uh, that, 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 that do build to a conclusion over many pages of rigorous argument. But there are pieces that sort of stand alone as interesting thought experiments or arguments whether or not you agree with anything else he says. So one of his famous examples is the experience machine, which sort of shows up in a weird form in, in the movie The Matrix, this idea of a kind of perfect simulation that would give you precisely the experiences in life that you want. And he's using this in the book in a way as a part of an argument about rights and utilitarianism and about what is sort of fundamentally important to people. Um, but you you don't sort of have to even be interested in these questions about uh, the, the state arising from anarchy uh, to, to find that an interesting and useful example to apply to other issues. And so I think um, – One of the reasons it's relevant is it's not one of these structures where if you pull out one piece, the entire thing topples. The the interest and relevance of 
uh, particular arguments Nozick makes don't depend on everything else that came before being completely unassailable. And, and, you know, he certainly, I think, would be the first to admit that in many cases he's sort of sketching an argument saying, I'm not sure this is actually, you know, a rock solid. I've proven whatever conclusion I'm arguing to. But, you know, let's let's see what this sketch gets us and move on to other ideas. So do we think that uh, any the relevance, for example, of the experience machine compared to uh, the foundations that he starts building for for the state or the minimal state that he advocates, uh, can, you know, there's a connection between those two at all uh, from the beginning of Anarchy, State, and Utopia and the foundation that he starts to build? So we should step back, I think, because we have to assume that not, not everyone who's listening here has, has actually read our Anarchy, State, and Utopia. Right. So let's, let's actually begin with one of those, those basic ideas that perhaps most of his argument would fall apart with, uh, without but is also something that many have accused him of being a little bit sketchy on, which is the notion of rights. Mm -hmm. He starts the book by saying that humans have rights and builds everything else upon this very strong conception. But what, what is his view of rights and where does he get it from? How does he argue that we have these things? So I actually think it's it's important to recognize that at least in the in the first part of that book, uh, right? The, the title is sort of a, a a map to the book. Um, you can you can basically it is split in fact into three main sections. One basically dealing with anarchy, the second with the state. This is sort of the response to John Rawls and uh, dealing with questions of distributive justice, and then the final on utopia, the idea of, of of libertarianism as a framework for utopias. And so most of the discussion of rights comes in that first section, anarchy. And the mission sort of of this first third of the book is uh, really to rebut the anarchist. It is a response to uh, you know, sort of Rothbardian libertarian anarchists who believe that if you accept a strong view of individual rights, self-ownership and property rights, that uh, sort of obviously follows that a state uh, is, is illegitimate. Uh, and I actually do think it's, it's important that he starts here because I think in philosophy, start in, starting points are tremendously important. I think you see a kind of pattern that if you start with the assumption, well, look, you know, the world is full of states, that's what we have, and, uh, and what should the state look like, uh, you are likely or more disposed to end up, I think, with stronger uh, statist conclusions than if you start from the question, how can it be that a state is justified at all? which might not even rely on a super strong notion of, of individual rights. It might just rely on the idea that um, it seems weird that, that some subset of the population, even if sort of majority approved, would, would be able to make decisions that would force other people to do things, but uh, – and that they would be sort of obliged to comply with and not, not resist if they can. Um, but – so the development of the theory of rights there is, I think – as he would acknowledge, a little bit sketchy. It is not a fully worked out theory of rights in part because the point of that part of the book is to say if you assume these very strong rights, could it be that a state is justified anyway, that, that despite um, these, these extremely strong rights which you might think would make a state impossible if they were scrupulously respected, still a state uh, could justly emerge. Um, and so I think that explains to some extent why you don't have a very – fully fleshed out theory there. To the extent you are, the, uh, you, you do though, um, he points to the, the work of Immanuel Kant, uh, who is a, a great liberal uh, philosopher, uh, certainly not a libertarian. Um, but the core idea there is one of Kant's three sort of famous formulations of his categorical imperative. The sort of probably the best known formulation is the formulation of universal law, that you should not uh, act except on a, a maxim that you could will as a universal law. Um, and there's lots of famous problems with that formulation. Um, you know, if the maxim is, well, you know, kill people when it would benefit you, then uh, it's pretty easy why that gives you moral rules everyone thinks are right. Um, but it's not clear exactly what maxim, uh, what, what the level of universalization should be. So, um, you know, become a doctor. Well, if, no, if everyone were a doctor, we'd all starve because there'd be no farmers. That doesn't seem right. So there's questions about how to formulate that maxim. But the other uh, – the other fame, or one of three other famous formulations of the categorical imperative, which Kant uh, claimed were all equivalent. There's a huge sort of secondary literature on how and whether that's really true, was the uh, – uh, the 
the formulation that, against treating others as means, the, 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 the kingdom of ends, well, it's, it's a separate formulation, it's, act, act as a member of the kingdom of ends, but the, that uh, you should treat humanity, that's right, it's the formula of humanity, treat humanity always, uh, never, never only as a means, but always also as an end in itself. Uh, and Kant thought this applied to you too, so you couldn't treat yourself in certain uh, abusive ways. But the proposition here is that respecting other people as equal and autonomous beings means that you must always treat them as ends in themselves and not as a means to some end. And for Nozick, the way you cash this out was with a strong theory of rights as what he called side constraints. Uh, and the contrast he's drawing here is with a lot of consequentialist philosophy. Uh, the idea here is that you figure out what's important. Um, very often, utility or the satisfaction of people's preferences, and there's lots of different variations of how that works out exactly, but that you figure out what's important in the world, what the good is, and you maximize it. So if what's important is pleasure or satisfaction, you maximize for the total amount of pleasure, and that might mean that uh, some people have to suffer a little bit uh, if that means other people are even still better off. Uh, but, but your goal here is to maximize the sort of sum total or the average, depending on your particular version, of, of what's good. And Nozick's idea is that this is not the only way to show respect for people, that, uh, that our moral obligations may not involve just sort of maximally promoting whatever is good without regard, uh, and this is a common critique of utilitarianism for sort of the boundaries between people as though uh, harming one person if it benefits 10 others is a, a kind of net benefit. Uh, Nozick says, look, you've just harmed one person and benefited 10 others. There's not some quantity you've maximized. Uh, but Nozick argues that if you take the separateness of persons seriously, uh, this is something also that characterizes incidentally Rawls' views, that you end up with a theory of rights as side constraints uh, that create sort of boundaries around them uh, where the way you avoid treating people as tools or means is that you treat them only in ways that they themselves have agreed to and that for this to be meaningful, you need to assume that they are owners of themselves. And then he goes from this to uh, – and this is sort of the controversial step uh, as far as a lot of people are concerned – uh, rights over the external world, rights over things you've mixed your labor with and acquired. So this is sort of a, a fusion of Kant with John Locke. I also think it's interesting that he uh, – my question before about the experience machine, which we raised, it's interesting that, that he also thinks the important thing here is it allows you to live your own life. That, that if you're treating people as ends – uh, is if you're treating them as means that you let someone do something, you use them as a tool to promote someone else's life or someone else's ends. Giving them side constraints of rights means that you have the ability to live a flourishing life. And that's what he says about the experience machine uh, in one of his lines. The most disturbing thing about experience machines is they're living our lives for us. And there's something that very, goes very – ties into the rights conception there. Can I push back, put on like a status hat? so to speak, and, and push back a bit on that and just ask, so if we can't, we can't use people as ends for others, but would this preclude, say, a paternalistic attitude where we're kind of, say, using people as ends for themselves? So we say, look, you know, yes, you, you can – we should – you have a right to, to lead your life how you want to, but a lot of people have mistaken views, say, about – the best way to lead their lives or if they knew today what they're going to know tomorrow, they would have made different choices. So someone – could someone say, look, there are people out there who are wiser than most or have more knowledge or groups of people who have access to better decision-making procedures and so they're going to violate these Nozickian rights for you, Julian, because we know that you'll thank us for it later. So I think this – in a way, is maybe best answered by some of the discussion uh, Nozick gets into in that third section, the utopia section. There's a famous sort of uh, passage there where he rattles off all, uh, a kind of list of different famous people, some of whom I guess, probably in 2013 would not be familiar names anymore. But um, but he sort of runs the runs the gamut. And so I guess you could you know you, if you wanted to do it now, you could say you know um, you know Lady Gaga and Pat Robertson and uh, 
uh, you know, Johnny Depp and, um, you know, the Dalai Lama and, you know, rattle off as many people as you like. Vladimir Ted Putin. Nugent. Vladimir Putin or um, Barack Obama. <laughs> and, right. You know, and I think the, the, the argument you would make is that people are sufficiently diverse, first of all, that it's just unlikely to be the case that anyone is wise enough to know what constitutes the good of others. But also, and this is getting back to, I think, the, the experience machine, which we, we should probably explain because I don't think we actually have um, fully, um, which is the idea that there is, one, because the, the good is so diverse, there, it's, it's hard to put your finger on, um, you know, a concept of welfare that is somehow the same quantity that's being maximized across all these different people, but also that what people care about is in some sense uh, living their lives as opposed to merely having lives that are good. Um, and so to, to kind of flesh that out, the experience machine is a, a thought experiment. And he sort of starts with a, a cruder version, the pleasure machine. He says, All right, suppose we think that what is uh, – important sort of morally is promoting pleasure and make sure that everyone has sort of hedonic satisfaction. So you can imagine a machine that you sort of plug into your head that just gives you, you know, a life of just waves of orgasmic pleasure. It's just better than, than heroin plus sex plus winning the Super Bowl and going on Space Mountain at Disney World. You just, you just feel pleasure your whole life and that's it. Um, and he says, well, that doesn't actually seem very – I mean, that might be fun for an hour – but that doesn't seem like a very attractive life, even if you could have, you know, sort of a, a, an IV drip that would keep you fed for, uh, for 50 years of this. Uh, and so he says, OK, the, the more sophisticated version is the experience machine where you plug yourself in and it's sort of like the Matrix um, with the crucial difference that the other people in it aren't real. Um, and so it scans your brain and it just sort of feeds you a lifetime's worth of whatever experiences the machine decides and just assuming that they've got very, very good AI or something. And so it, it can actually tell what kind of life would make you happiest. And so it gives you uh, the life of a great novelist or a rock star or a global adventurer or your Sherlock Holmes, whatever it is you think would, uh, would be most satisfying for you, the machine gives you. And it can even maybe make changes over time as it learns uh, from your evolution. And Nozick's point is, you know, some people might plug into this, certainly if you had a really miserable life and you were, uh, you know, very sick or otherwise having a bad time, um, it might make sense for you to plug into this. It might be better than a, a very bad existence. But a lot of people wouldn't. And we think about why a lot of people wouldn't. And they think, well, first of all, people don't just want to have pleasurable experiences. They want to do things. It's not just that I want to be – have the experience of feeling like I am a great writer and be, you know – the experience of being invited on the talk show and, and people, uh, you know, saying nice things about my books. I actually want to do it. Um, and I want those reactions in some sense to be authentic. Um, I want to have a satisfying uh, romantic life, um, and, you know, a spouse, let, a spouse who loves me, let's say. Um, but what I actually want is for that to be the case. I don't want there to be a kind of experience of a simulation saying the words I love you. Um, I, I actually want to be engaged in a real relationship with another human being. And so the, the point of this in some sense is, well, is dual. One, that in general, what matters is not just how things feel to us. Um, the, you know, from the inside on the experience machine, it might be sort of subjectively indistinguishable, the difference between being a great writer and feeling, you know, having the experience of being a great writer or acclaimed as a great writer. Um, but that one, we actually want to live our lives and, and, and make choices and uh, have things be the result of what we really have done in the world. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, uh, in some sense, you, if that is something we care about, because one of the reasons utilitarianism and various consequentialist theories like that are tempting is, well, look, the satisfaction of our preferences or pleasure or whatever are things everyone really cares about. Um, but if it turns out that lots of people, and we don't think this is irrational, would not choose the sort of ideal satisfaction of all their sort of subjective experiential preferences, would, would avoid that in order to have a real existence, uh, live their own lives, uh, shape their own lives, then in some sense this is something that – 
cannot be done for people. It's not it's something you cannot give them. Uh, and so in a way, it, it makes a system of of boundaries that permit people to shape and steer their own lives uh, in, in a way more important morally. So it just shifts the weight of that in the in the kind of hierarchy of moral values um, so that you have to factor that in as opposed to just, well, how satisfied do people subjectively feel? But couldn't say like a conservative who's opposed to drug use push back on that by saying, yeah, that that sounds great in the abstract and it would be wonderful if everyone's lives were self-guided and they, they fulfilled them how they see fit. But we're talking about actual people here who have actual weaknesses of the will and all these other issues. And so say there's this <clears throat> really awful drug that people tend to get into when they're young and they're not, you know, not making good decisions when they're at that age and you take it, you get a little bit of pleasure but then it destroys your life. To say, well, but you know, people should be self-directed. Seem could could that be placing this ideal world over the enormous destruction such things could do? So, you know, are are there limits to these rights as side constraints sorts of arguments based in self-directedness, where we say, look, but this sort of behavior is so destructive, and so few people, when we poll them after they've done it, say, yeah, I'm glad I did that. Well, so of course, Nozick doesn't doesn't really talk very much about children. Libertarians are sometimes criticized for not um, not thinking very much in their theory building about about children, and, uh, except perhaps as an afterthought, and, and perhaps that is a, a, a well taken point. Um, so I, I mean, I, to the extent that you're talking about you know people making choices literally as you know minors, um, I don't think. As most libertarians would say, well, you know, you have sort of the full complement of adult rights. But adults make bad decisions too. Adults so we could we could drop the children part, right. and it would. So, well, so the, then again, of course, the question is, is that is that is that actually a sufficient objection? So it may be the case that um, if people make their own decisions, um, sometimes those decisions will be bad, and sometimes they'll even be worse than uh, than. You know, the kind of the, the wisdom of civilization um, would have, have guided them toward um, had someone had the authority to prevent them. Um, but again, I think probably what Nozick would say here is that uh, respect the, to the extent that we respect people as autonomous beings, if the reason that, that what happens to people um, matters in, in, in a way that's more important uh, or generates different moral rules than what happens to animals? And we, you know, we tend to think for animals, uh, you, you might be ethically obligated not to torture them or cause them to suffer needlessly. But basically, um, you know, whatever obligations we have toward animals are, are basically just about promoting their welfare and not about um, respecting their autonomy. Um, I think for Nozick, the, what distinguishes people is that they are fundamentally choice-making beings, and that, that includes. Um, you know, accepting the possibility that their choices may go wrong, that, um, but that if all that were important were kind of maximizing how well people's lives go in, lives go in retrospect, um, then we would not be importantly different from animals. That that aspect of autonomy of deciding on your own good um, would would be missing. Um, and there, I mean, there, there are other, I think, you know, pragmatic arguments. One might make as well, but from the um, from the perspective of rights, I think Nozick's counter would just be um, that that's not that's not the centrally important thing. That you know, not regretting your choices um, is 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 actually not more important than shaping your life, even if you shape it badly. You know, what's important is that it is your life to shape. Um, now that said, of course. People can also choose to join communities where there are strong pressures to um, to conform to whatever people think the best kind of life is. Uh, and so again, we get to that third section of the book where one of the ideas is that um, people might choose to live in communities where uh, you know drugs are not allowed. I mean, people people in real life do in fact sometimes you know do this, right? You check into rehab if you have an alcohol problem, or you. You know, at any rate, live you with the Amish permanently. Yeah. But yeah, you you choose at any rate to live in a community where those uh, temptations aren't present. Uh, you know, you join a church where um, 
where there is strong pressure to avoid those temptations. So if we're, we go forward from the theory of rights, I think it's interesting we have, you know, first the straight paternalism, you can't put this in your body, uh, which is something, as you said, a conservative would say, uh, or even many liberals or leftists. If it's sugar. Yeah, if it's sugar <laughs> or salt. But we could go forward to rights for private property acquisition, which Julian mentioned, uh, sort of Lockean in its sense, uh, and maybe not a perfect – a perfect philosophical move, but uh, Nozick never really said he made perfect philosophical moves. But after you have property uh, and now we have a different type of maybe violation, uh, possible violation that could make people's lives better, which would be distributive justice of some sort, the welfare state. What does Nozick say about what we go – how property rights exist and then how maybe welfare state possible is possible or not or worthwhile or not? Um, so I think just an interesting thing to note at this point is that, um, again, from this kind of Kantian basis, right, Nozick does move through a, a variant on the kind of classic no, uh, Lockean argument for property rights, that uh, if you start in the state of nature, people mix their labor with uh, elements of the natural world and thereby um, – come to, to acquire strong rights over those elements of the external world. Uh, a lot of thinkers, uh, I think it's probably G.A. Cohen is, is the most famous here, have sort of agreed with Nozick up to that point and said, um, well, if you don't grant that part, you can assume all of the self-ownership stuff and still end up with uh, you know, a, a highly egalitarian set of rules. So for example, suppose – um, it's not that you can unilaterally appropriate any piece of the world, but that other people who might also want to make use of that property um, have a veto. And so in that case, he argues that, that to avoid the veto, um, you would get a very egalitarian distribution of that, uh, of that property. Um, but uh, assuming that much, um, you, of course, have the, the – obvious problem for any kind of redistributive taxation, which is um, that for for stuff to be redistributed, you need to take it from someone else. And if they have strong rights over it, then that um, isn't going to work. But, but even actually bracketing that, I think the, the argument can work because, um, you know, the point Nozick makes is that most value is not just sort of inherent in, you know, natural resources, but is kind of continuously created through people's labor and efforts. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we probably don't want to say, I think, you know, taxation is theft. That's like a, a popular slogan. I don't think it quite captures the sort of complexity of actual um, reallocation in a democratic society. But um, he does say, I think it's it can be seen sort of through the lens of theft or is morally, is it in a morally interesting way, tantamount to or related to theft because it involves essentially using people's labor for the benefit of others, uh, forcing their labor to be devoted to ends that are not their own. So it is, again, a way of using people as tools by requiring that their productive efforts uh, go to benefit others chosen by the state. Um, and so I think in some sense, you can even bracket the external world, the external resources argument and, and still get a, a fair amount of the way um, by noting the way in which there's something sort of morally unattractive about the idea that the value people are creating through their labor is being sort of uh, without them having a say in the matter, or certainly about what you know, proportion of it there is, uh, is going to be redistributed, being used for ends that they haven't chosen. I think this this gets at an issue that shows up in a lot of egalitarian socialist sorts of arguments, which is this lack of appreciation for how much of a connection we feel to the products of our own hands or the value that we create that um, egalitarians often seem to – they value certain sets of rights very, very highly. So our right to freedom of speech or freedom of conscience, belief, but – and they say because you know that's – it's in a sense it's very more it's more damaging to us. It's extremely damaging to us to have those things limited, to have our conscience to be said you have to hold a certain set of beliefs or you can't say these things. But but they seem to discount how much of a connection we feel to I, I you know, I actually think that's wrong. Um I think that you that might be a, a, a fair sort of argument against sort of 
mainstream modernists, progressive egalitarians. I think it's certainly not true of Marxists, right? I mean, the idea of the alienation of labor is, you know, in a lot of ways at the heart of, of, of the Marxist indictment of capitalism, the idea that, um, that people are compelled by the capital system um, to labor, you know, as part of some process that creates, you know, basically widgets for, for, for someone else's use uh, in, in a way that uh, is disconnected from their own lives. So they're going and they're pulling a lever on a, you know, a, a conveyor belt for uh, 10 hours a day and then uh, alienated from the products of it um, in, in a way that, that saps a lot of the meaning from work. But is that um, is that a distinction that the egalitarian critics of Nozick would recognize? Because so in that in that Marxist conception, we are due to these economic structures that are kind of forced upon us by those more powerful than us. We're we're forced to labor, and then we're forced to have that the products of that labor taken from us, alienated from us. But if what we're talking about here is something more just like redistribution, broadly speaking. Um, then that redistribution would also exist in a economic system where we're each laboring in ways that we want, producing things that are meaningful to us that don't we don't feel alienated from it. But then a portion of that is taken from us forcibly in order to redistribute. Well, so stepping back, I think the the argument Nozick makes that I think does. Uh, to work across the, the, the board here is you know, s similar to that, but that um, just that that most discussions of redistribution take kind of the 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 sum of social wealth as something that just exists Occurs, to be parceled yeah. out, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you know, and from that point of view, if some people are are you know, far wealthier than others. That just maybe it's sort of arbitrary and crazy. Um, and but the point that, that of course Hayek uh, also stresses is, um, you know, wealth isn't just there to be distributed, uh, and that in fact even the word distribution of wealth is, is somewhat misleading. It gives the idea, uh, you know, presents wealth as something that kind of drops into the world, and then you have a political system that parcels it out according to some formula when, in fact, wealth is produced, often produced in unpredictable ways, right? I mean, people innovating and creating new things, new forms of wealth that didn't exist before, and that to the extent that wealth comes into the world, um, you know, attached to particular minds and bodies and productive capabilities, um, you, you need to sort of pause before you even get to uh, ideas like distribution and say, well, what entitles you to um, to essentially determine how that wealth is going to be distributed? What uh, you know? What creates that right? And so, you know, I think the the, the counter is, of course, um, well, existing sets of property rights themselves are um, themselves a kind of distributive mechanism. They are the product of state coercion themselves, and so um, there isn't all that much difference between a kind of explicit distribution and one that arises through the operation of a set of state enforced property rights and you know th that's an argument that you can go back and forth on for 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 quite a bit um, but I think you, you've at least progressed somewhere if, if you're moving the argument to that point um, and thinking of it in terms of the incentives and productive capabilities that people have as opposed to treating the social distribution of wealth as, as this kind of arbitrary assignment of mana that, that exists out there somewhere. Well, that's probably a good segue into probably the most famous example in Anarchy State and Utopia about property and justly acquired or not and possibility of redistribution, the Wilt Chamberlain example. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain was a as a 60s and 70s basketball player, for those who don't know. So we could update it to the LeBron James example, possibly. It's, it's yeah. important because at the time, and this is this has actually been weirdly misunderstood uh, in, a, in a terrible piece that showed up in Slate a couple of years ago. But um, the reason he chooses Wilt Chamberlain is that at the time, uh, Wilt Chamberlain had just signed a contract for what was at the time the sort of the highest salary that had ever been paid to uh, certainly a professional basketball player, maybe a professional athlete, period. And so there was a lot of discussion in the press about whether this was reasonable, whether this was fair for, uh, for basically one person to make so much money just playing basketball. Um, and so his... 
uh, his choice of Wilt Chamberlain there was to say, okay, let's you know, let's, let's take this let's take this guy example that people think is a sort of egregious uh, unfairness or inequality, and the example works as follows. Um, and I, I should say in advance, this is an example whose point I think is often misunderstood. Um, whether whether or not what I think the correct sort of reading of it is is Nozick's, I'm not totally sure. Um, but I think the the, the the interesting point of it is slightly different from what it's often taken to be. Um, but the example works as follows. Let's start assuming your favorite theory of a just distribution of resources. So this is actually not turning on any particular theory of just acquisition of, of uh, property through mixing labor or anything like that. He's saying whatever you think is fair, people have whatever they mix their labor with, great. People have uh, whatever distribution makes the – the worst off people in society best off, great. Totally equal distribution of resources, great. Whatever it is, whatever you think is the correct pattern of distribution of resources, that's what obtains. Everyone has what the best just theory requires. And then he says, now suppose uh, Wilt Chamberlain and a few other people are agreeing to put on basketball games. Uh, and everyone voluntarily – or not everyone, but large numbers of people voluntarily go – to see those games, and uh, you know, so there's even a bucket where the well, amount I think he foregoes his salary, right? He just says, I think in the example he says, I, I'm going to have a bucket that says money for Wilt. Uh, right. that, that's all the money I get. Every single thing that goes in there is someone. It's like when Radiohead sold their album for zero. Right. So when you go to see the game, uh, there's a um, right, there's a box with Wilt's name on it, and you put in a share of the ticket price that's his share. And he says, suppose after maybe a few years of games, um, through everyone making you know, a, small con- a small portion of their ticket price deposited into the Wilt Chamberlain box, uh, it turns out that Wilt now has more money than anyone. He has vastly more money than anybody else does. Um, and so then the question is, is this unjust? And Nozick's argument is, no, because we have at the start a, by stipulation, just distribution, whatever you think that means. And we have arrived from there to a just distribution through only people disposing of their just shares according to their own uncoerced choices. Um, you can uh, argue how well this represents all the workings of a, a modern capitalist economy. But the the point there is that if you want to say justice and distribution is fundamentally about the pattern of distribution, what you have to kind of buy for that to work, and as this example tries to illustrate is, well, then, then you have to believe that it is possible to get from a by stipulation totally just distribution of resources – to an unjust one purely through people voluntarily disposing of what their just resource shares were. And you sort of have to ask, well, if the point of having resources, if if the point of having something that is your just share of resources isn't that you then get to use it in the way that you think is best, then it's it's not clear why you you care about what what people's – um, right, share share of resources is. And so he says, look, there's got to be something wrong with a theory of justice if it says that through this process, people just voluntarily disposing of what is by stipulation their just share, then there's got to be something wrong with that. Uh, the problem then with pattern theories of justice is that um, the pattern is upset as soon as people make free choices. Um, Again, there are lots of arguments about why in various ways, uh, you know, seemingly free exchanges in the capitalist society may may not be as free as, as they seem. Those are sort of extrinsic to that as a principled matter where, you know, within the confines of this thought experiment, a pattern theory tells you you have, you have somehow injected injustice from a, a just starting point purely through voluntary, unforced, uh, just, one assumes, transactions. Do you think that uh, Nozick would have an opinion about whether or not a, a patterned system of justice, if you just freeze the world at time zero, uh, 
and uh, you see that you know A has five and B has two and C has one, and you say, well, that's just unjust. I can just tell by looking at the pattern. Uh, would, would he say that you could ever do that by just looking at a pattern or would you have to look at the history? When you say that when you look at the history of A having five, B having two and C having one, you saw that C used to have – used to have uh, five, but A beat him up and took took four from him, and now he has five, which would make it unjust. Or you saw that C had five, and A transferred something to him, or he gave A for the four, so that's how this arose. So could you look at a time slice of a distribution and determine whether or not it's just or, or unjust? Do you think Nozick would have an opinion about that? I think he wouldn't – you know, in a sense, uh, a, a, a progressive friend of mine – made the the point that uh, is in some sense well taken. I think this is actually a fair, a fair enough point, which is um, that it is actually the libertarian who needs a patterned theory of justice. And this is something I, I, I have not perhaps thought as much about as I could. Um, but the point is, look, on Nozick's theory, justice is not a matter of patterns. It's a matter of justice in acquisition. So do people initially acquire property from the state of nature or from an un- un- unowned state in a way that is itself just. And then justice in transfer, that is to say what makes the transfer of resources from one person or group to another fair, you know, wasn't fraudulent or coerced or uh, meets whatever other conditions you want. And then a, princi- a, a principle of justice in rectification, meaning, um, you know, if someone is stolen or, or through negligence harmed another, how do you restore uh, the balance when violations of rights occurred? And you know the, the point my friend made uh, was, well, look, obviously history up to date has not observed anything Nozick, you know, the, even remotely kind of fits Nozick's idea of uh, of these principles. Um, to, right, to lots of lots of property is either owned by the state or you know directed to people through state redistribution or been stolen, um, and that this is right. This is this has sort of gone on for so long. Um, that it's probably kind of incoherent to say, well, how do you remedy it and get you know get everything back to you know the people who justly would have it in the counterfactual? Um, and so the argument is, well, so actually, it's libertarians. If, you, if this is how you think things ought to work, um, then don't we actually need some theory for how to kind of reset not just from individual rights violations, but from kind of systemic uh, centuries of uh, of illegitimate ways of allocating property, uh, and Nozick himself actually at one point in the book sort of acknowledges this. I mean, it's like a, I think a footnote or at least a very brief passage where he says, "Well, of course, right? You know, uh, history doesn't look like the thought experiment I've constructed. So maybe you would actually need some kind of one-time reallocation to get back to." a sort of fair starting point. And then from there, you can just have a historical theory. Um, but he doesn't really get, get very far into what that would look like. Well, I think it's interesting too because libertarians, I think this is a very good point that we have to deal with head on. And a lot of the left libertarian sort of group, if we want to call them that, uh, talk about this more than, than other types of libertarians. I think it was Benjamin Tucker. Uh, it was a, an older philosopher who's featured on the site, I think, talked about, you know, we can't have the railroads, the, cor- the, the corporate form, like everything about this has been skewing the world unjustly. We're not at time zero. We're, we're, we're in a pit of, of injustice and, and we have to figure that out from here. Right. This is the term that left libertarians tend to use as they distinguish free markets from freed markets. And so they, they prefer to use the term freed markets because what that implies is we still have somewhere to go, that the existing structure of the markets is based upon all of this past injustice and unjust transfers and aggregation of wealth through course of means and whatever else. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is important points. I mean I often find myself throwing my hands up and saying, uh, what can you do? And that's which is one of your first reactions. You know, you know. Okay, my my ancestors were in northern English, attacked by Vikings. I'm going to go to Sweden and ask for a check. Uh, I, I, what you can do um, is the difficult problem. There are more direct things. You know, we can give money to the people who were interned in Japanese camps, like because they were actually there, but maybe distant ones, not so much, or at least learn from history better so we don't have so many unjust transfers. I don't know if it sinks libertarianism, but it's something we definitely should be concerned with. Uh, so the uh, the Will Chamberlain problem, 
uh, I wanted you to clarify, Julian, what did you think that people – how it's misread, right? What, like you think there's like something that people think think it stands for, the Will Chamberlain example, that is not exactly what it stands for? Well, so what some people object is, look, Nozick is just assuming the sort of strong property rights that he thinks um, he, he's sort of proving. Um, that's to say, what, you know, he assumes that there is nothing unjust when people voluntarily transfer the, their their money to, to to Will Chamberlain, and he ends up uh, with a vastly unequal share. Um, you know, they're just ass- he's just assuming that the um, the right to your share means a kind of unlimited right to dispose of it in perpetuity in some way. Um, and I think that sort of misses the, the 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 point because I think the 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 point of the example is almost in, in the form of a reductio, which is to say, if if your theory entails that um, from a perfectly just by stipulation starting point, you can generate injustice purely by voluntarily disposing of your shares in some way, then there's something at least intuitively very suspect about your theory. If, you're, right, if, if your theory requires that, um, that injustice can be generated through kind of purely Justice. mutually yeah. consensual uh, use of what people are presumed to have rights over or, or stipulated to have rights over. That there's, there's something odd about that theory. Um, and I think that's a, a fairly compelling argument. I will, I will stop for a second and say um, there are probably ways in which you can counter that because I've thought – I've tried, tried to think about what's, what is actually a better kind of counter argument to the, the Wilt Chamberlain example – um, and one of them is this, is that there are effects that are emergent. So you might imagine a lot of people uh, who own factories that are emitting pollutants of some kind, but which if you take any individual factory, um, there's basically no harm. If it was just that factory, it wouldn't harm anyone. Um, and so you could say, well, each factory kind of taken individually um, is not doing anything wrong. They're using their own property in a way that doesn't actually harm anyone uh, or violate anyone else's rights. Um, but it might be. I mean, again, let's just forget what you think about current environmental debates. Let's just stipulate for the purposes of a thought experiment that if there are a whole lot of factories emitting different chemicals that sort of combine in the air, there are uh, sort of aggregate effects of that that do, in fact, harm a lot of people. Um, And you can say, well, so this is a harm that eventuates even though everyone is doing something that is individually not harmful to others but is on aggregate harmful to others. And so someone might say – well, the fact that someone ends up with a wildly disproportionate share, um, you know, has all sorts of other consequences in terms of the disparate power it gives them, and that so that is is by analogy to the sort of pollution example, uh, a way that yes, through people doing things that they're individually entitled to, taken in isolation, you can have aggregate results um, that that are not in fact just or that are unjust in some way. Um, but then, so I think that would be an interesting counter. And then you'd have to kind of get into the question of whether something like that is plausibly true of uh, inequalities in wealth. Um, but I think that would be a better response. Which would be very of the times because it's sort of the the one percent in the aggregate are the problem, right? Or the point zero one, the super super rich are the in the aggregate are more the problem than any specific rich person. I think is sort of one of the you know emerging critiques of, any, of wealth inequality. Well, it is an argument. I, I've always thought that this was the argument against inequality that libertarians sort of have to take most seriously. It's a better argument against inequality, whether or not you on net think it is persuasive, which is um, you, you can't totally separate uh, inequality of resources from political inequality. That if you allow wealth to be so concentrated that there's a small, uh, you know, some small number of people who have um, you know, more than the entire like, bottom half of the population combined, um, th- those people will necessarily sort of dominate um, politics and, uh, and exercise that power in, in ways that, uh, that harm other people or, or, you know, subject them or make them subject to their will in various undesirable ways. Um, and that's, you know, I think, you know, a th- an argument that we can respond to uh, in, in a whole lot of ways. I mean, one, one argument to make is just that, that – um, Question then is, you know, where do you concentrate power in a way that that uh, that will have the ability to undo, um, the other you know, right the the <laughs> the concentration of resources and when does it kick in? Um, 
But in a way, I think that's a better kind of argument because it's at least sort of getting at the right kind of concern, which is the exercise of control and the exercise of power other, over over other people, as opposed to inequality in itself. In itself, just you know the the the, the raw fact of a particular distribution being problematic, and so I think that in a way is advancing the the ball to a more useful place. That sounds like an episode in of itself. So a lot of these <clears throat> concerns that we've raised or counter arguments that we've raised are about there's there's a given problem that people think is there and we're going to rectify it somehow and the way we're going to rectify it typically is is state action. So let's let's use that as an opportunity to move into the a discussion explicitly of this state. But first let me see so we just kind of summarize where we've gone and where we are now before we talk about the state. We've we've had Nozick say individuals have have these rights which function as side constraints. So they're they're things that you cannot violate. No matter how good the consequences might be, no matter what other reasons you might have, there are always limits on whatever action you might take. And he derives those from or to some level bases those in this, this Kantian notion of treating people as ends in themselves, the, the need for people to be self-guided in their lives. He then moves into one of the offshoots of that is this these strong property rights, that we, we have a right to the product of our own labor and that it's it's not permissible to take from us, um, that he has these principles of justice in holdings, uh, acquisition, transfer and rectification. Um, and so the, the question then is <clears throat> these are all very strong limits on permissible actions yet Nozick is – is not a anarchist, that much of the book takes the form of an argument against the anarchists who he seems to be saying like, look, in the beginning, I'm going to accept your views of rights but it's not going to take us where you think it's going to take us. So given how strong these, these rights are and these property rights are, he, how, do we, how do we get to a state and what, what sort of state can we get to from that very strict foundation? So we get to uh, what Nozick calls a, a night watchman minimal state and the, the argument here is um, actually fairly sophisticated, somewhat technical, involves some sort of game theory at some points. Uh, and So it's hard to summarize accurately but um, I'll, I'll give it a shot uh, though really you should probably just read the book if you, if you want the um, fully developed version. Um, so he starts with uh, I think an idea that will be familiar to libertarian anarcho-capitalists which is um, in a stateless society um, because it's not very efficient for everyone to just sort of enforce their own rights, um, you would tend to get uh, what he calls protective associations. Um, and by, by enforce your own rights, what he means is like defend yourself. So right. someone's coming to steal my stuff. I'm going to be the one who – Or your stuff has been stolen or you have been defrauded and you, you, know, you, you don't want to just go and punish – uh, the person who's uh, who you think has done it. Um, so this is in massively inconvenient for for those of, you know well, those of us who are not Chuck Norris. I think it's um, interesting. I mean, he does start with the idea too that anarchy is not going to be total chaos. I mean, he, he basically says, yeah, a lot of things. You know, the people will have moral constraints on them. It's not going to be complete chaos. But then you're going to have a problem that you know, if Thargor, seven foot five Thargor, takes your stuff and you're five foot four, uh, you're not going to be able to get it back. So let's have some protective associations. Right. So his idea is that there will be these protective associations which sort of specialize in enforcing people's rights and that um, certainly at least for conflicts between their own clients, they will want to have some kind of clear procedures for uh, – determining guilt and innocence, determining liability and uh, enforcing appropriately. Everyone will uh, also – one of the things they'll want from their association, he suggests, is um, to be protected from the unreliable enforcement of other people. So the idea here is if someone says, you defrauded me, um, you harmed me through negligence, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, extract compensation for you. You're going to want your association to step in and uh, – Essentially, say, okay, well, wait. You can only uh, you can only extract retribution from our client if a certain reliable procedure to determine guilt or responsibility is used, and so we will protect our client uh, until we are satisfied that uh, that procedure has been met and that this person does in fact owe such and such. Um, just and to clarify these these protective <clears throat> associations, just because this is a pretty abstract idea. We're talking something that looks kind of like a combination of a HOA 
and a insurance company, insurance company and a private security force, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, a kind of private mini state that's just uh, there to arbitrate disputes and enforce rights. But one that you you go and sign up for, like you sign up for yeah. cable like, internet oh, service. Oh, Aaron, who is your protective agency? Oh, I'm I'm on blue, and you blue, cut them a blue arrow, check yeah. and they give you these <laughs> services. And so. Uh, the the argument Nozick develops is look what will happen over time is that because actual conflicts between agencies would be extremely costly right this isn't just sort of market competition of the kind where you know you go out of business if you uh, uh, if your product is out competed but but you know if it comes down to it physical combat uh, competition that uh, over time there will be an ad- uh, sort of an advantage towards converging on one agency, which is the, the strongest, the most able to enforce its requirement that its clients will only be punished subject to procedures that the agency itself believes are appropriate. Um, and so one kind of key premise here is that once you outsource uh, rights enforcement to a third party, um, and if, even if you don't, frankly, because people have often different judgments in, in complicated cases about contracts or fraud or you know, negligence um, about who exactly is responsible and for how much, um, even when they know sort of all the facts about their own actions. Um, but certainly when you are outsourcing this to a third party who may not know whether or not you're guilty of assault or theft or whatever it is, um, that there's a sort of epistemic problem. What, what procedure is going to be used to determine when it's appropriate for rights to be enforced? Um, am, am I within my rights in protecting you against someone else's assault or am I violating your rights because you do have a right to kind of forcibly extract compensation? Um, you can you can sort of be reasonably ignorant about that and so you can be justified in sort of preventing someone from extracting retribution or compensation given that you in good faith have a contract to protect that person um, and you don't know that they really are guilty. Um, and uh, and then also just sort of the fact that there will be a tendency to converge over time because the basically the, the biggest and strongest agency um, will reliably be able to prevent enforcement against its clients except according to the procedures that they approve of. And this is a huge marketing point, right? If you're um, a client to the strongest agency, you will only be subject to that agency's approved uh, procedures for determining guilt or liability. Uh, a member of a smaller agency uh, that, that can't stand up to the bigger agency um, won't be able to promise that. The bigger agency can say, well, no, we're going to impose the procedure we think is reasonable for determining whether your client uh, owes our client compensation. Well, I think there, there's also sort of the uh, the nature of the firm that, that uh, the, if you're in the same protective agency as, as the person you're having a dispute with, it's, it should be easier to solve within the firm possibly. And so if there's a networking effect. It's kind of like Facebook, better, yeah. better than Google+. Plus. The more people who are on it, the better it gets. So then what do we get after that if we have an agglomeration of them? And so Nozick's argument is that what will emerge over time is either a, a kind of geographic monopoly within a given area. The strongest agency will – um, then be the one that basically gets all the customers because you don't want to be the customer of the weaker agency that um, can't effectively enforce your rights or promise that it will do so. Um, or you'll get a kind of macro federation that will be you know, tantamount to that, which is to say um, there will be some kind of umbrella alliance among agencies that are roughly equal in strength um, to agree on procedures or some kind of um, super arbitrator that will arbitrate conflicts between them, but this will be basically equivalent to a uh, a geographical monopoly on the use of force that is the classic kind of sine qua non of a state. And so let me ask about how realistic right. this is. I mean, granted, this is this is a hypothetical story meant to tell, not how states actually emerge, because of course it's not how any state any existing state actually emerge, but how a state might emerge without violating the rights that right. he set out in the first part of the book. But if if the argument is so we've got, you know, me defending my own rights and enforcing my own rights is not realistic or efficient for a whole bunch of reasons, from I'm not very big and lots of people could beat me up to I simply don't want to put the time into it to whatever else. So I hire some company that's going to do it for me. 
and there's lots of these little companies that are competing. But at some point, <clears throat> because these companies, it's much more efficient to work things out based on a set of procedures than to go to war with each other. Um, and so they'll set up overarching organizations that will set the procedures for multiple companies or because if if we're talking about having my life defended, being with the biggest and best guys is obviously better. And so we're going to naturally gravitate toward the bigger protection agencies are going to get bigger. And so we'll, we'll get to this one. Why doesn't this – I mean won't, wouldn't those sorts of same arguments about efficiency and all of that apply to states? Like why – states go to war with each other. Real states go to war with each other all the time um, and obviously war is very inefficient and it would be much more efficient to work things out through all these procedures but they don't do it. Right. So to the extent that this is supposed to have any kind of justificatory force, part of what Nozick is trying to do here is give the the best realistic background assumptions. Um, so I mean sometimes you can't just assume that everyone always perfectly respects everyone's rights and there are no um, – you know, there are no real conflicts. Or that's so unrealistic as to be not very useful. Plus, we wouldn't um, need any of this story right. about protection agencies exactly. in the first place. Um, but, but it also has to be a pretty good um, sort of scenario, in essence, to have justificatory force. Right? Um, you can you can get all sorts of outcomes if you sort of just assume, you know, I guess people are rapacious and terrible. Um, but that wouldn't be a justification. It would just sort of be like, well, if everyone acts atrociously, you, will, you would get this bad result. Um, this is only sort of an interesting justification if, he's, if, if we're kind of assuming the, um, the best realistic preconditions. So people basically accept this theory of rights, of, of strong self-ownership and uh, strong property rights. Most people, most of the time make a, a good faith effort to abide by them, although some people don't and other people sometimes, you know, hard, as often happens, harm others by accident or not realizing it or, um, you know, sell them a, a, a shoddy product and there's a question of who's liable. Um, and so, you know, you, you do note though that, you know, the, the wars between states tend to happen at boundaries uh, you know, I mean, you know, between states, that is to say, um, that and that you do find actually a in, in the real world geographic kind of monopolies of force um, as a practical matter. And the question is just, well, but, you know, often those are achieved through uh, manifestly unjust means. The The point of this is to sort of say, look, even under the best realistic conditions, you would get a state. And a lot of people sort of in response to this this argument say, well, that's that's all well and good, but of course we know real states didn't arise this way. So why would this justify justify any real states? Um, and Nozick is sometimes a little fuzzy on exactly how he thinks that step works. Um, but I think the to, to reconstruct it sort of charitably, um, the way it works is if you know the anarchist argument is well we should abolish states and return to anarchy. Um, if you can make a pretty compelling argument that the best case scenario from anarchy is that after a lot of conflict, um, you end up back in a state, um, even under these, these sort of, if not ideal, optimal realistic conditions, then that's a pretty good argument for sort of accepting the state as such and then just trying to make sure that it is no more expansive than – uh, the state you would have if people were in good conscience trying to obey uh, the sort of libertarian rules and, and sets of rights. Okay, but so Nozick, so far we haven't gotten to a state yet, right? We, right. We've we've gotten to we've started anarchy, and then these protection agencies, a whole bunch of competing protection agencies, started up, and then through this system of just competition and um, consumer we, choice, consumer yeah. choice uh, incentives lead us to. If not only one protection agency left, there is at least one really dominant one and a handful of smaller ones on the periphery. But this isn't a state in the sense yet that so far everything is still voluntary and what sets the state apart is that the state can compel us to follow its rules and that it can tax us to pay for its services and we're not, we're not quite there yet. So how do we get from this still voluntary system to 
something that actually looks like a state. Right. And so that the final move there um, is the idea that there's a the, the, the dominant protection agency will sort of reasonably want to prohibit even independents, so be people who are trying to enforce their own rights, from, from doing so. Um, so that if you're, if you're, uh, you're not a client of the state or, or, the, or the dominant protection agency or, or, or any other protection agency and you just want to sort of uh, take your own initiative to extract compensation from people you believe have wronged you, um, that the DPA, dominant protection agency, um, will sort of stop you from doing so and say, no, 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 only our procedures um, can be used to determine the guilt of our clients. You can't sort of self-help and force against them. Um, and Nizik's argument here is, so th- there's again that epistemic problem, which is to say, if in fact your client is guilty and the person seeking to enforce their rights you know, really is entitled to the compensation they're demanding, um, then it is sort of wrong to prevent them from taking their compensation. And so you should, um, you know, you, you shouldn't do so. Um, on the other hand, kind of from a, a subjective perspective, given the limits of your knowledge, um, you are doing sort of what, given what you know, you are entitled and, and obligated to do. Um, and so the move to the state is, in a sense, a way of compensating the independents for preventing their self-help enforcement. That is to say, uh, the state is sort of saying, okay, we're going to only allow the enforcement of rights under the procedures we've approved, acknowledging that this will prevent some people from enforcing their own rights, even in cases where they're absolutely entitled to, um, because we need to be sure, because we don't know who those people are in advance. Um, And so the idea here is, well, that's Given the sort of uncertainty about uh, whose rights have been violated, who is guilty or liable, um, who is owed compensation, they're sort of they're acting reasonably in doing this. And indeed, um, everyone will want their protective agency to do just that, um, which is to say, ensure that only its procedures can be used to enforce rights. Um, but on the other hand, this does sort of necessarily mean that some people's rights will be violated, and so they need to be compensated for what they've lost. They've lost the ability to self-help enforce their rights, even when you know, they would be totally justified in doing so. And so the compensation is the state sort of protects everyone within its geographical uh, boundaries or within the dominant protection agency, protects everyone over whom it is sort of asserting this authority to... Um, to uh, approve the procedures used for rights enforcement. Uh, and so you end up with an organization that is, without any really invalid steps, uh, protecting everyone within its domain. It's sort of the invisible hand of the state, right? It's like right. the spontaneous order of the state. It's not, it's not consent. I mean everything is consensual there. But it's not a social contract area in viewpoint or anything of that sort. Sure. But spoiler alert, um, most anarchists – don't buy this argument and they think there are problems with it. And I confess like there are parts of it that feel deeply dissatisfying to me. And I think I think it's that – the crux of it is that compensation issue. So let's say that we all own houses and we all have lawns and we like mowing our – we all mow our lawns, right? And then I start a service to mow lawns and Julian and I sign up for it. It's great and we're the dominant lawn mowing service. But Trevor still likes mowing his lawn and he's not – My own he's, lawn. His own lawn and he's, he's not harming anyone by doing it. Um, and I our, – our lawn mowing service shows up and we say, look, we're going to charge you – we'll charge you $10 to mow your lawn for you. And Trevor says, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to I wanna mow my own lawn or I want to start my own service over here to mow the lawn. And we say, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to compel you. We're going to use force if necessary to take your $10. And Trevor says, well, now I've been, I've been hurt. I'm out $10. Um, how are you going to compensate me? And we say, well, we're going to compensate you by mowing your lawn. Like that lawn mowing was worth 10 bucks, and so your compensation is you've gotten your lawn mowed, which is precisely the thing Trevor didn't want in the first place. Yeah. Well, I think that – I mean that's that's – that's an interesting point for justification of like political authority and whether or not this compensation is is a, a 
you know, justifies the fourth force or comp compensates for the force. But I think it doesn't really apply totally to Nozick's example because it has the possibility, the very important element of the independence in this, is the possibility that they may they may run up against and accidentally do violence to one of the clients, which is I might not accidentally mow someone else's lawn. I don't think, but like the in 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 a world where there's only a few independents left after the dominant protection agency exists, they're still living in this world uh, and you know may. May I hit someone with their car who's who's a client of the dominant protection agency, drop something out a window. It's that sort of integratedness that I think makes them but take that, this over. But that would only seem to get us to if the independent has this sort of negative interaction at some point with a member of this dominant protection agency, then the protection agency can exercise authority over mm -hmm. that person. But that's not how states work. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not like – the state doesn't totally leave you alone unless you do something you're not supposed to do. The state – in this case, the, the protection agent can take your money up front in order to pay for your rights protection. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny because we're, we're actually talking about something abstract but a lot of these issues have not been abstract. Like the idea of self-help in the history of this, of this actual states, not in Nozick's – Nozick's thought experiment, the pr banning self-help from the state, like in, in, in the Anglo-American system, the, the state doesn't like you to enforce your own rights, and it's not because it's not because you may not have a good claim to. The only one left is self-defense, which is I think funny for Julian's point about the epistemic sureness of it. Self-defense is the last place where you have to be you have a reasonable fear of imminent bodily harm, so you know immediately like that guy isn't a hurt me. I have that's the last self-help right you have. So the state has taken away self-help rights uh, in order in order even for people who don't agree with the state. So it, it's just a matter of course, even before taxation, right? That, that happened, you know. In the 1300s, before taxation was really a thing on the level we have it today, and I think another another problem I see with this argument is, especially as an argument against um, anarchism, as opposed to just an argument for what a good state would do and look like, is is that a state a state demands an exclusivity on authority. So within a given area, no one else is allowed to compete. But the whole – I mean the, one of the base arguments that the anarchists make is that the benefit of – one of the benefits of anarchism is that this competition say between any sort of firms but between protection agencies in this case will lead to better services. That if a given protection agency starts behaving unjustly or privileging certain people or charging huge rates, they can up and go to a different protection agency and so it's, it's a check. But once we've got a dominant protection agency, what's to stop it from behaving in all these bad ways, jacking up its rates to an enormous amount and using force to compel them or deciding that if you know certain people it likes, it's going to just not ever punish them for whatever they do and everyone else is prohibited from starting up competing agencies? So I, I will say the the um, my recollection is that Nozick does assume that the sort of the holdout independents have to be compensated for being kind of prohibited from self-help enforcing, um, but and, and get kind of the basic minimum protection package, um, but are not necessarily taxed. If I'm remembering correctly, um, the the other the, the point I'd make specifically about that though is, um, I mean, I, I, and I think this is sort of implicit in a lot of Nozick's argument, which is the arguments for the efficiency of competition in general assume. Kind of the restrictions of normal market rules on competition, um, and you, you can't really generalize that to competition for the coercive enforcement of those rules itself. Um, that that in, in, in essence, competition is not necessarily efficient when it takes the form of uh, people with truncheons and guns fighting each other. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that the. Uh <clears throat> the point about taxation you said is really interesting because I mean I, I come from the law side here, so so all these things we talk about with like when you have jurisdiction over them, and you could if if the people who are non-compliant are actually exempt from taxation in Nozick's book, then you have something interesting. You have like like a tariff system, which is how the United States was largely funded before income tax. That's a tax on you being in a place. We have we have authority over you to take because you're here. Tariff, you had to actually do something to get taxed. You could avoid it, I mean, but the government was supported almost entirely by tariffs, and so the, there was no exaction for general. If you weren't trading goods, there was no general exaction 
to the state. Doesn't it also raise a free rider problem if if they can't compel taxation or paying for the services? Because presumably defending people's rights and then having some sort of system for arbitrary disputes and all of that costs money or uses resources. And if I know I'm going to get rights protection simply by saying I'm an independent and I don't have to pay for it now because I'm going to be compensated by having it forced upon me, by having it given to me, then why wouldn't everyone just declare themselves as independents um, and now there's no more resources to work with? Right. Now, that's the obvious problem. Now, I, uh, my recollection is that certainly Nozick does make an argument against that being a justification for taxation. And he says basically um, – I mean actually I think he actually also uses lawn mowing as uh, the uh, – uh, as, as, as the example if I'm recalling correctly. He sort of says, um, you know, look, if you, the fact that you've uh, – Gone around and, and provided everyone with a service like long long you know they haven't asked for it doesn't then entitle you to um, you know insist that they chip in their uh, you know their share after the fact. Um, but I don't remember, does does he does he actually address that that problem um, the free rider problem Yeah, I don't remember now if, if he does. I should I need to go back and reread it. I don't think he actually hits that. He's sort of assuming that he's sort of moving kind of from. I mean, I guess this is. But the problem here is, right, he's moving from a kind of fully voluntary, competitive, protective association scenario where you are not going to get protection if you're not chipping in um, to a scenario where, right, I mean, and, and indeed you have a, a very strong incentive as rights enforcement comes to be dominated by protective associations, um, you know, the vast majority of people he's assuming – Will indeed want to want to pay one of these associations because you'll be in a much worse off position if you are not protected by an association, and um, and better still, you want to be protected by the, the largest and strongest association. Um, and so then he moves from there, from the single dominant association, to the argument for compensating independence. And I don't recall that he actually then says, uh, you know, has something to say about well, once that's in place, why would everyone keep paying in? If you can still get the same services without it, he may, but I don't remember that. Certainly, he doesn't. He doesn't do it at any length because I would remember that. Well, let's let's move on then to the last part of the book, which is the utopia section. So, the state that we've developed. Let's let's accept for now that his argument works, and we've justified this minimal state. And the but the minimal state is limited pretty dramatically over what most states do right now. It's it exists only for rights protection. Um, it, it can stop people from using violence against you or destroying your property or stealing your property and it can get you compensation if they do. But that's that's about it. It doesn't it doesn't get to do much more. And a lot of people see that as a a lot of people on on the left or progressives or communitarians see that as a really kind of impoverished view of the state. It's not a satisfying view of the state because first it doesn't allow for transfers and welfare programs. It doesn't allow for the sorts of regulations that many feel are necessary. Trevor Beneficial paternalism, yeah. Trevor Right. And, and it, it also in this, this sense that a lot of – especially communitarians have that the, the state is simply the community kind of working together by radically limiting the reach of the state. It's, it's limiting this community which is very important for people. So Nozick's last section is, is kind of a pushback against that general attitude that he wants to say, look, this minimal state, yes, it's extraordinarily minimal by standards of, of typical states today. But he says it's a – it's actually a really inspiring vision and he does this through this argument that it's a, it's a framework for utopia. Um, right. And the argument there, of course, is that people have uh, very different ideal worlds uh, or at least the you know, best, best possible worlds or best possible communities. And so we shouldn't think of the sort of libertarian political solution as being the sort of end of our efforts to craft a good society, but as establishing a kind of framework within which different communities can form and, uh, and establish rules or, uh, that go beyond what uh, a libertarian state does, of course. Um, both in terms of the rules they impose on people, I mean, you think of of various sort of associations of uh, you know, homeowner associations where you can only paint your house certain colors, um, or 
mutual aid communities. Um, or hippie communes, yeah. Right. Or, or right, utopian communes or, uh, you know, but certainly the, the kind of mutual aid societies we saw in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries, you might become a member of an organization that agrees to, uh, you know, help you if you become unemployed or injured in some way, uh, or you might, you might do that either kind of at an arm's length kind of purely commercial insurance transaction. You might do it through um, a community organization that is, uh, you know, thicker in some sense and more participatory, um, but that you would allow a, a kind of thousand flowers to bloom. You would allow uh, many different kinds of local rules, um, local aid programs to flourish and let people uh, decide, in a sense, which, which of these communities they found most attractive so that you would you would have in many ways or at least in many places all the things communitarians and others think are important and necessary for the state to do. You just wouldn't have them done through the state. Uh, you would have them done through people voluntarily coming together to do them. It's sort of a interesting. It's a, it's a very big philosophical description of a lot of stuff that people here at Cato talk about, like whether it's uh, discussing free market education and, and saying let a thousand flowers bloom, let's see the possibilities of schools or possibilities of free market health care. It's still the possibilities of freedom uh, for a well-lived life or a more fulfilling life or one more interactive with your community with without an a, a oppressive one-size-fits-all structure coming down. It's something that I think we don't talk about enough in libertarianism, the hopefulness and the and the human empowering element of it. Right. I find it to be a really humane vision for the world and I do find it, as he said, I think it's it's extremely inspiring because it gets us back to where we started, which was these rights being based in self-directedness and respecting people as people, as as individuals, that there's there's a sense libertarians are often criticized for that sort of argument because it's taken as kind of a cold and atomistic individualist, you know, every man for himself, that what it means to say that all of us have these rights and we can't – those can't be violated is that all of us should kind of only look out for number one and not worry about the needs of others and not participate in communal rela – community relationships. But, but in fact, this – what this does is this gives us this kind of baseline protection that all of us need in order to define our lives, live the lives that are deeply meaningful to us, to, to live them with other people who agree with us because recognize how, how important that is but also to recognize how wildly diverse humanity is, how, how vast the number of interests we have and the, the kinds of lives we want to live and to really respect that and allow us to all live the kinds of lives we want in peace with each other. Yeah, diver diversity is bred by certain minimal constraints. I would say, you know, if we, if we all voted on a national radio station, uh, I, there's a lot of people I wouldn't want to live next to. But thankfully, we have you know minimal minimal of that, so I can totally live to, uh, in con you know in concert and go to concerts with many different types of music fans who aren't trying to impose their preferences on you. So I think the last question that we we need to address before we finish up is whether or not uh, Nozick rejected libertarianism. This is uh, something that gets often repeated by many people when uh, a libertarian hit piece is written or maybe specifically Nozick hit piece is written. Uh, one of my friends was, was told this recently uh, in, his, in his philosophy class. His philosophy professor said, well, you know Nozick rejected libertarianism, which I think is first A, funny because it doesn't actually – matter because it's not an argument if, if against the, his, the arguments he makes in Anarchy, State and Utopia. But uh, Julian, you're, you're probably the best person to ask on this. Uh, what – did he reject libertarianism? Right, so I, I actually interviewed Nozick shortly before his death in 2001 uh, or, or I interviewed him in 2001 shortly before his death. I think he may have actually died in 2002. Um, but right after the publication of his book, Invariances, um, his final book as it turned out, um, and he had their – uh, a section on ethics, what he called the core principle of ethics that uh, seemed to me to be very um, libertarian in spirit. And so he affirmed to me that uh, that he, in fact, still thought of himself as a libertarian and really always had. There was an essay, uh, I think published in his book, The Examined Life, called The Zigzag of Politics, which was widely read and I think actually reasonably read. I mean, if you, if you read this essay sort of standing alone, it does sort of sound like a repudiation of uh, his former libertarian views, which he describes as seriously inadequate. 
Um, <clears throat> and what he said to me at the time was, well, no, I, I thought I was just sort of saying I was less hardcore of a libertarian. He was arguing that it might be legitimate uh, in various ways to, um, to you know, have compulsory public support for different kinds of programs to achieve various good things. He just seemed to say, well, maybe these don't work very well, uh, but still, if the community sort of has decided that it's going to express its um, its uh, values in this way, you you kind of uh, are obliged to go along, and, and the zigzag of politics um, will decide which things work and which don't over time. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds not you know like a rejection of libertarian ideas. I think the the kind of way to interpret it consistent with what Nozick is saying is maybe in a sort of a principle of um, of humility, and, and this is perhaps a kind of a subtle distinction to make, but that <clears throat> if you know you live in a polity with people with different ideas about what the state is justified in doing, um, that the appropriate approach is let's say not the external one, which just says, well, this is just theft and, and slavery and coercion, and you know, totally indistinguishable from just a, a marauding gang taking things from you, um, and should be kind of the whole thing should be regarded as uh, as totally illegitimate. Um, a move to sort of an internal perspective, um, where you can say, well, look, uh, I, you know, I still think that the libertarian rule set or policies are the best ones, um, but that. This means that right, you have one of many conceptions of how the state ought to operate that are in competition that will zigzag back and forth, uh, and that you should sort of, the, the 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 correct approach is to sort of treat this as a problem from the inside of convincing other people of your um, of your views and you know while they hold theirs as opposed to viewing the whole thing as a kind of criminal charade. Um, and I you know I think that's that's actually probably. Um, you know, in some sense, whether you think it's philosophically correct or not, probably not bad advice um, as a practical matter. I'd like to thank Julian for joining us on Free Thoughts. We welcome your questions and comments. You can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And you can find me on Twitter at T C Burris, B U R R U S. And uh, I am normative, N O R M A T I V E. And to learn more about Robert Nozick and other libertarian topics, you can find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.